Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with my rather good friend, Louise Goffin, and she has just released, a couple of days ago, a beautiful album called Two Different Movies. Louise, how are you? Hi, Warren. I'm great. I'm so happy to be doing this with you. What a wonderful collection of musicians you got to work with here. This is pretty, pretty insane. To say the least. It was pretty insane. Yeah, it was. It was like a dream list. My executive producer, Mitch Rudman, whose father is Cal Rudman, who started first the Gavin Report and then Friday Morning Quarterback, you know, so he was a promotion man. I met his son at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp teaching a songwriting class, and he bought some CDs, and then he started... Uh, just chasing, <laughs> writing me, I always say this, 80 billion emails. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, eventually got my attention because I just thought, well, these emails are so long, I can't possibly read them all. Um, <laughs> but he, eventually, he eventually got my attention and uh, he, he really was just wondering why I wasn't in the studio, why I wasn't making more records. And uh, he, you know, bankrolled me making two albums. It was a pretty embarrassing dream situation. Like if I had come over to your house and say, you know what? Here's what I really wish would happen. You'd sit me down, you'd pour me a glass of something, you'd say, all right, well, that's never going to happen. So <laughs> what's, what's your next plan? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, uh, yes. I mean, like, if I if I, if I can sort of like point out some of like the heavy A listers here, it's pretty fantastic. Uh, first, obviously, well, Bemont, of course, uh, for Keys, Bemont Tench. For those of you who don't know who I'm talking about, um, obviously, very famously Tom Petty's keyboard player, but a stalwart out here for um, sessions. I mean, incredible player. So, and that, the best, and the best. He's uh, just the best. And I mean, Jeremy Stacy on drums. King insane. Crimson. <laughs> yeah, incredible. Um, and then, of course, Doug Pettibone. I mean, that's that's pretty pretty immense. I mean, these these are just names. There's so many great. I mean, Wally Ingram playing percussion. I don't. I I feel sad only just catching a couple. Of, Pete Thomas. Wow. Some Elvis Costello yeah. thrown in there as well. Yeah, I actually um, after Pete did that session on a Made to Be Good. I, I somehow wrangled uh, Elvis Costello's email out of him <laughs> ah. and wrote Elvis to, and asked Elvis if he would sing a duet with me. And he wrote me back. And at the time, he was very involved in a, a play that he was workshopping in New York, and he couldn't do it. But he wrote me back and we had a conversation. And I, I think me writing him reminded him that he'd written a song with my mother a while ago. And the next thing I know, he had put out that song. So, uh, yeah. And then, and then I met him recently in Nashville. I, I, uh, since I had his email, I said, I'd love to come see you play. And so uh, Nicole Atkins and I went and saw him play and saw the gang. And that was a fantastic show. So, yeah, all of these musicians now... It's not like I sat home and looked at credits and said, hmm, who am I going to get? All of them came by way of having either worked with them um, or known someone who worked with them or Dave had worked for them. And, and it was really, it was a little bit of a this is your life tangled web we weave situation. You know, I wasn't randomly picking people. There was, it was a real, you know, heart music connection with everybody there. Charlie Drayton and I go back a long way. <laughs> we were in a band together in the early 80s, which was just, I mean, I must get in touch with Steve Jordan and I must get these things out of my attic, but you know, it was Steve Jordan, Charlie Drayton, Sara Lee on bass, and, and Steve and Charlie were trading and me, and we were called the Raging Hormones. And, and that band went on in different forms with Steve, um, the, at different incarnations. Uh, but yeah, we, so we hung out a bunch in New York and it was just a dream. And I, and I saw that he was coming, he lives in Australia. I saw that he was coming to LA and it was unbelievable that the timing was such that we could get Charlie in 
to play drums on a couple of songs too. So it was just, it was really a beautiful thing. That's so amazing. What was the process? So you, you got somebody who came to you as sort of a, what do they call those, like an angel investor, somebody that wanted to really encourage you to um, get back in the studio. And obviously you've made many, many albums. Um, I think last time you and I talked on camera, I, I brought up Kid Blue, which I had for quite a few years now, which wasn't your, was that yeah. your first or second record? It was actually my first. That was a kind of auspicious start, wasn't it? Because it wasn't Don Henley on that record as well? Yeah, that was, um, well, Danny Korchmar had been playing with, uh, of course, James Taylor, who we knew since mm -hmm. he was at least 13. And um, he'd been playing with Linda Ronstadt. Um, and I actually had gone to Peter Asher. I mean, I was 17 at, at the start of all that. I was signed to Electra Asylum. I was 17, and uh, the guy at the time who signed me, uh, who's no longer with us, uh, it said I had to finish high school. He said, it's not going to make a record with me until I finished high school. So I finished high school, and we thought, oh, you know, Peter Asher, he's the guy of the day. He's the guy doing, you know, he was in his his prime as a record producer. Yeah, and, Linda uh, Ron starts, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Ronstadt and James and Warren Zevon and the whole nine yards. And uh, he said, you know what, I can't do this, but you know who would make an amazing producer is Danny Korchmar. And Danny hadn't produced anything. Danny, you know, was this, was a side man, although a lot of really cool ideas came from Danny, you know, like James Taylor, let's do Handyman and slow it down, you know, and mm -hmm. He, he had a lot of great ideas. So um, that's how it came to be that Danny did it. And uh, Danny, you know, knew the cats. Like I remember Jim Keltner coming and hanging at the studio and it was Wadi Wachtel and Don Gronick, you know, and I have that, that album has finally reverted back to me and people say, why haven't you released it? Re-released it. I will at some point and I won't wait too long to do it, but I just feel like, that point was an education more than anything and that uh, Danny really wanted me to be rock, you know, and I, I was playing very soft, plucky, folky songs on guitar before that. And so suddenly I had to sing at this different level than I was used to when I was taking voice lessons and, you know, trying to belt like Linda Ronstadt. And, you know, <laughs> so when I hear the record, I feel like I'm not really... Um, I'm not really in my body or my voice fully yet. It's it's still a learning experience. So I, that's how I knew a lot of those people and had them on the record. It was it was really down to Cooch, and um, he was a wonderful I guy. Just did, <laughs> yes, yes, he is, and we, we go back a long way. There's a song we did that Stevie Nicks wrote, and I remember we went over to Stevie Nicks's place. I don't even remember where it was, and she had boxes and boxes of cassettes in her living room and a little, you know, Wurlitzer or, yeah, I think it was a Wurlitzer or a Rhodes in the living room. Um, and she was just going through things and saying, oh, what do I have? What do I have? Let me see. And she pulled out a cassette of If You Ever Did Believe, which she had at that point never recorded. That was actually the following record. You did the record. Now, you told me on the phone the other day that you recorded this at the same time as the first record, like over a period of several months with, with our mutual friend, Mr. Dave Way. How did you go about deciding what is album one and what is album two? Was there some kind of thought process behind it? There wasn't. I came in, he said, come on over and, you know, bring songs. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a Dropbox folder. I mean, it, it is a thing with me because I... I write songs almost as a way of life, like part of breathing, you know, it's like part of my, I don't know, I go off into different places, do a lot of songwriting retreats, maybe not so much now. Uh, and I write songs and I'll have them on my memo or I'll have a demo and I'll forget about them. Uh, so I did some digging and, and there were a lot of songs I loved and particularly it was a lot of songs I'd written with Billy Harvey because we attempted to be a duo um, in 2013. And we wrote a lot of songs that year together. 
in addition to the ones I was writing on my own. But we had this chemistry and the songs we wrote together just had this, I don't know, we, we seemed to bring out the best in each other's writing and singing. And uh, so there were all of those that were there. And then there were songs, sometimes older, like a really long time ago. And then there were songs from 30 years ago that either didn't make it on an album or, uh, you know, I didn't like the version of it, never got it right, wanted to redo it, or maybe I got it right and it just was so much of that time I wanted to do it again because I thought the song was timeless. So we had this Dropbox folder, which I think started with 30 songs and went up to 50 songs at one point. I'd written with Marvin Etzioni earlier that year. We wrote this incredible song, um, Let Me In Again. And so we just sat down and came up with a list. And then we came up with how we were going to, which band was going to cut which song. So we'd say, okay, and we didn't, we didn't map out the whole thing. We just said, how about on this Monday, we'll bring, you know, Charlie Drayton and Sean Hurley and Mark Oldenburg in, you know, and Dylan O'Brien was almost always there. He was always there and uh, always contributing something great. I think the very first session, we might have gotten six, uh, might have gotten four songs, but the rest of them were like three songs in a day. And we would just cut one or two days of the week and then, or maybe a third day. And then that's it. We wouldn't come back on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We would do any overdubs then on the spot. And, uh, and that would be it. So even though it was done a while, there's a, there's a freshness because we didn't labor over overdubs. The only time we overdubbed a lot more was like Greg Lease came in for a day you know, and put down things. And then, and Ben Mott came in for a day and put down things. Uh, but aside from that, it was, it was treated like a band. Whoever was in the room, you know, that's how we did it. And, and there was no record. It, I wanted it to be a triple record. So oh, you did? <laughs> quite, yeah. So I, I was like, let's do all of these and I put out a triple album. It's going to be a gatefold, a triple gatefold. <laughs> And, and I was uh, talked out of it because, not by Dave, but just by people around me saying, no one's got an attention span, you're going to waste it all, it's all going to be over, you know, break it up. And, and there really was no rhyme and reason to which songs went on which album. What happened was, is I started to put out singles. So I say, I'm going to put this one out, and then I'm going to put that one out. And then when the first record was assembled... I wanted to include the songs that I'd already put out as singles on it. So that decided the tonality of the record from the get-go. And then this record was a little more leeway than just the leftover songs because th there still are a number of songs that aren't on this record, maybe three. But for some reason, this record had a flavor and a story to it. It was... It, it just seemed meant to be beautiful. Dave is a is is a wonderful guy, and he's he's got a way of just making everybody feel at ease. You you know you forget when you're hanging out with him. You know his resume and some of the insanely huge albums he's worked on, because he's just so such a sort of everyman, and I mean that in a really positive way. No ego whatsoever. So I can imagine the sessions being a lot of fun. Um, having, yeah. And I love this idea of everybody playing together and finishing the basics of the song on the day. Cause most of the things that we grew up loving have that, they have that sort of, you're, you're in the zone, you know what you want. Everybody's, you know, contributing to a song. So often these days we're forced into situations where you put a, you know, vocal acoustic down, drum track, and then two days later you're putting a bass line down and this, and, and it, it starts to sound like a lot of very tight overdub parts and less of a, of a feel or a consistent groove. So that's, that sounds beautiful, the way of working. I have to, uh, scrolling through these credits, I have to uh, highlight Van Dyke Parks. I did get to work with him quite a few years ago now. And, uh, just it, just his name alone, like, 
gets me all excited. You know, you you immediately think of, you know, the Beach Boys. You got the Brian Wills. You know, everything everything I remember reading about um, Los Angeles from the '60s when I'm sitting at home in England. Van Dyke Parks was like just that name, like. I mean, his arrangements are really, really beautiful. So um, the song is Oh My God. Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, that's one of my favorites on the record, actually. That song was a song that I had done in my studio and came up with all these parts and I was just mumbling nonsense lyrics on it. I didn't have a lyric and I brought it when I was bringing songs to Dave and played him that. You know, we sent some songs to, a couple of songs to Van Dyke. Uh, we had the budget for him to do two songs. And he chose Chinatown, which was on the first record and uh, Oh My God. And oh my God, I was just mumbling stuff on it. And we cut the track. It was, it was Charlie Drayton and Sean Hurley and Mark Goldenberg, although I don't know if there's a lot of uh, guitar that's left on it because it's, it's so orchestration heavy. And Dylan O'Brien. And then we did a big session, you know. Um, I would say Four months after we started the record, we went into the village and we had, I think it's approximately 25 piece uh, orchestra. There was harps and woodwinds and strings and Van Dyke conducting. And it still didn't have a lyric. He was like, Louise, it would really help if you would send me the words. I go, I know, I know, I know. And it wasn't <laughs> that I wasn't working on it. It's that I just, I kept saying, you know, I really, I have to believe myself. I have to believe what I'm saying. And I, and I really didn't till like, till after the orchestration was on it. Then I wrote a lyric and, and even then we changed the track a bit because it, it was so floating and eccentric and it was hard to figure out where the song lived. But once I had a lyric, I put some, you know, roads on it and vibes. It wasn't roads. It was Wurlitzer and vibes, and it, it grounded it more. And it made all the, the it made the arrangement make more sense. The song suddenly came together, and the mix is great on that song. So yeah, that's the story of Oh My God. And it's funny too because when I first did it, and it had no lyrics, and I was just mumbling, I thought this sounds like a John Lennon track. And then it went through all these changes that it didn't even sound the way it did in the beginning. But then a, a review came out and said it sounded like a John, John Lennon song. And I thought that was funny that that element had somehow come through. That's beautiful. I'm reading the lyrics. I'm trying to ascertain. Yeah, I'm getting it, it. What I like about it is it's, it feels quite stream of consciousness in, in, in quite a few moments. Is it an actual experience of being with somebody or is it is an amalgamation of, of, of events. It's not literal. The thing that's weird about it is that I wrote the lyrics uh, three years ago. Right. And the lyrics sound like I'm writing about the beginning of quarantine COVID, where <laughs> we're, on, we're on the rooftops and there's songs floating up over the city, you know, from building to building. Slept and to the edge of the city, yes. Slept at the edge of the city on a cold winter's night with songs drifting over the rooftops between the stars and the lights. Yeah, I mean, I saw it as a very cinematic, almost, you know, surreal situation. That sounds like the early stages of love to me. That too, but it, it, what it is, it's a love song to like, okay, without offending anyone or getting religious, <laughs> it is like a love song to God in a way. Yeah. It, 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 is, it is coming to, let's call it a... Um, intelligence greater than sure. my own limited, you know, between my ears and, uh, and saying, you know, now you take the wheel. This is as far as I could get it. And what I ended up with is a bullet in my heart, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you know, 
it, though, though our pleas, you know, we keep coming back even though our pleas are denied, you know, even though you don't give us what we want on the shopping list, like, please, I need this. Here's what I want. You know, the Santa <laughs> Claus God. Here's a list of the things I want you to shop for me. Yeah. Um, and, and it is this thing of, you know, this feeling like something big is coming and, 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 and the requirement that there's surrender in that, you know, there really Beautiful. is surrender. Yeah. I worked with an artist, um, actually an artist in the studio, owned the studio that you and I first met in uh, 30 something years ago. Not that either of us are much over 30, of course, but but anyway. Like at uh, the Sundays, <laughs> in the countryside of, of England. Yeah, at the in Sundays, the countryside of England. Well, the band, yeah. the band, the Deep Season, um, it was two two sets of brothers. There was uh, Nick and Patch yeah. Hannon. Of course, Patch was in the Sundays. And then the other two uh, brothers, uh, the Jameson brothers, well, Nick and the Jameson brothers were in this band together called the Deep Season. Kevin would write similar kind of songs. That's what I was thinking when I was reading it, because he would write songs where people would say, is this a love song? And he's like, kind of, to God. And it would do similar things where there's that sort of ambiguity where you're talking about because here it's like we slept on the edge of the uh, at the at the edge of the city, which to me obviously feels like in the hills looking down. I love that. I love that imagery on a cold winter's night. Uh, songs drifting over the rooftops with the stars and the lights. Our bodies warm in the altitude. It was a beautiful view. Every sunrise written was like a letter from you. So it sounds like you're sharing an experience with a significant other, but you're you're attributing it to God. And I, I love that a lot. I think it's very beautiful. But I had to ask that question because it had that same Kev Jameson ambiguity, like, is this to God or is this just, oh, my God, this person? So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, well, definitely the sunrise, every sunrise was like a letter from you is definitely like saying, hey, God just yep. sent me a letter. You gave me yep. a sunrise, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, thank you. It's I beautiful. remember you talking about those brothers before. That they were, they had a big part of, you know, your. Oh, absolutely. Starting, yeah. yeah. That's well, fantastic. Well, Sean, obviously, uh, is a good old friend of mine, amazing bass player. Um, I don't yeah. think I, I don't think I know bass player who is more likely to play the right thing first than Sean Hurley. Yeah, well, that was the first time I've worked with him. And uh, there's a lot of that kind of uh, muted bass, you know, on some of yep. the songs on the record, which I love. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really, there's a song called uh, It Started a Long Time Ago, which I, I love the production on. Actually, it's the very first song that we cut. Butch, Butch Norton is playing drums on that. It's the very first song that we cut. And uh, I'd written that song on ukulele, like all in one night in New York. Um, and it just, it, you know, it has that kind of bass on it, like do you know that muted thing which i i just love yep i always attribute that to carol k that kind of boom yeah i think boom, of the wrecking boom, yeah. wrecking crew yeah very time. wrecking crew what i particularly yeah. love about sean is he's usually the guy i have to ask to play a little bit more you know as opposed to the guy that i'm trying to spend take stripping him back to the essentials he always starts off with the essentials like holds the song down Get, gets it to the place it was supposed to be. And then you go, hey, put a fill in here. Try something there, you know. It's interesting when you work with, you know, probably quote-unquote seasoned musicians, how they can make you feel like they're band members. It's almost the best attribute of a great session player. When I think of, obviously, Danny and, and, the, and the section, obviously, with Leela and the Russ Conkle and all those guys, when they were working together, every record they made, whether it be, you know, obviously very famously, your mum's absolutely massive records, it's like... They just felt like a band as opposed to a bunch of players that are trying to show off on how good they are. And it's an interesting conversation because so many musicians say to me, oh, I'd like to do session work. I could play that. And I'm like, yes, you can play that. But would, you, would that be what you would play? Because I guess it might sound deceptively simple a, because it's exactly well the put. right yeah. thing. That's really well put. And, and, and that is true. And, and the artist is an important part of that. Actually, Jim Keltner told me that um, because I did eventually call Jim Keltner again um, a few years ago after my dad died and, and we made an EP, um, but, and, which he was on. But he said that when the cats get called by people for a new artist, 
and expect the cats to deliver something that's going to make or break that artist. He's saying, we can't do it. We can't do it because we're looking to you. You are, you are our leader. You know, even, even if we're a band, you know, even if they do come up with that feeling of like, we're the band, you have to know enough to know where the emotion of the song is so that they can contribute to what that emotion is and, and deliver. If you don't know and you're looking to them to provide the direction, it, it won't deliver. And you're, and he was saying, you know, people would just be wasting their money hiring the cats, you know? Yeah, it comes from the artist, the song. Yep, definitely. Uh, Val McCullum's name I see here. What a, what a lovely guy Val is. And a real guitar slinging. <laughs> now, had you worked with him before? Well, the, on those sessions uh, that I was just discussing with Jim Keltner, um, it was Barry Goldberg and I, uh, and Val McCallum and Bob Glob, and it's basically Jackson's band <laughs> with uh, Jim Keltner on drums and Barry Goldberg on keyboards and me on piano. And Nico engineered Wonderful. that. Our pal Nico. Nico Ballas, what an amazing talent. Yeah. Uh, and Fernando. I see Fernando uh, 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 played some on this as well. Oh, he, he, was, he was crucial on both records. He really was. He came up with just Wonderful. great parts. And, t- and Tim Young came up with amazing Wonderful. parts too. Here we are, we're listening to The Simple Life, and it's just like... Really, really fat. I love the drum tones. I know Dave's really prides himself on on like going for really big fat, very beakly, you know, mono overheads. I know he's big on that. Yeah, it's great. Really, really beautiful. I mean, did you have did you did you both sit down and talk about how you wanted it to sound? Or was it really just developed the way it developed? I mean it's funny because we did a lot of filming during the record and after I went to Blackbird I was looking, oh, I said, oh, he's using a D19 there. And, you know, there's the 251 <laughs> that he's, we're, we're, we're tapping, you know, tapping on the leather chair with the 251 up close and, and, and all these things that I didn't notice about mic placement. But that was totally his domain, you know, microphones. Um, although we did, you know, I did discover the Vanguard uh, V13 during that record, it was uh, Peter Chun, his assistant, had found this mic and they had sent it to Dave's studio. And he had a couple of, uh, I think it was it called the Myrtle mic, the round one with the yep. thing in the middle. It looks like an old radio. He had one of those, which I sung on the first day. And then I did the V13 and I loved the V13. And he hadn't really used it either. He was like, this mic sounds great. And I'm going, this mic does sound great. Very affordable, and um, I ended up getting a stereo pair of them. And a lot of the vocals I did I recorded here in the Magic Tree House in the back. And Peter came over in the beginning, but then I started, you know, recording and comping them myself. And my thing with the vocals was, except for Oh My God, I went back to Dave's studio once we kind of changed things around, and most of that vocal was just done in his place, but. My thing with the vocals was to always listen to the tracking day vocal and just keep asking myself, am I beating it? Am I losing anything? And I was uh, super detailed. Like I would import even the takes that we didn't use my vocal performances into the comping tracks. So I basically listened to everything I ever sung. And if I, you know, I didn't go for trying to improve the tuning or something in, in a new vocal. It had to at least meet the energy of the tracking date or beat it, you know. Yeah, it's it's a really big, fat-sounding record. When I first moved to Los Angeles, that's one of the things I loved about out here is that there's such a massive influence of classic 70s music in what everybody does out here. You can't really escape it. There's sort of, you know what I mean? This beautiful kind of almost like tubby drums, just big fat tones. You know, I think of like the Wrecking Crew, then of course the the section after that. There's two sets of like 
guys and girls that went around just playing on all of his amazing records. And I think it seeps, it seeps into our, um, you know, subconscious and, and, and yeah, it's a beautiful sounding record. But but then there's a huge happy dose of Beatles in everything in this. You know, very white album, which I think is not talked about enough. I think a lot of people, we, we name check Abbey Road as being the masterpiece that it is. But but the white album has such a huge profound effect, I think, on many of us sonically. That it has these very similar drum tones, the piano tones. Here, Dylan O'Brien's piano on this, on, on, on the first song, just totally screams Beatles to me. Totally. I mean, well, well, I wrote that piano part. He played it way better than I could play it. And, you know, right. I grew up on the Beatles. I jumped around, you know, I remember jumping around at my girlfriend's house and we would pretend we were the Beatles and, you know, listen to mm -hmm. that White Album endlessly. And Dave, too. I mean, you know, there's a picture of Ringo right above the drum kit. And yep. we all love the Beatles. The other beautiful thing about Dave's studio, as you know, at Spitfire, is that when you work in the same environment and everything is set up, I mean, obviously, you know, mics get put away, but you've already dialed the room in. You know what parts are your room and you know where you want to put microphones. And it was it's just an amazing thing to come in with a band and everyone feels like a band and everyone's open to inspiration or changing things and you're not waiting around to get a drum sound you know you can just immediately go let's let's get this let's cap capture this right so rattle and roll give us a little bit of tell us a little bit about that well that was one of the ones billy and i wrote together um that was a song that went through all these changes. Like it was, I think it was called the long something. I can't remember. It had the word long in it. Yep. It started off as a different song. It was, it, we wrote that in 2013. One of those weeks where we had bands come in, Billy at that point, I think lived in New York. He'd moved from LA to New York and he was going to be in and Tony was going to be in town. So we put, we put it together. We pretty much, you know, got jack shit um, to play on it. We got Pete Blow. We didn't get everybody. We didn't get Davey. Um, who was playing bass on that? Oh, it, it was Sean. Yeah, Sean, yeah. Sean had already been on the record. And we cut a couple of songs with that band, with uh, Billy and Sean and Pete and Val McCallum. And that was one of the ones we did there. And yeah, I, I love that. And he came up with that, you know, kind of that O oh, Cecilia drum beat at the beginning. Yep. More wonderful references to classic songs. Heart Attack. I remember Heart Attack really well. Um, I was, at that point, I had had a little room at the village. In 2012, I had a room. It literally was a closet. And Jeff Greenberg said, you know what? We we're going to turn this crop closet into a room for you. It was on the top floor and they took out the legal pads and the tape and all the things they were storing and they put some lights in. And I had a little room that was my writing and, you know, pre-production. Beautiful. Room. But I couldn't get in that room that day. So they, um, they put me behind the front desk and I never can remember the names of the studio. <laughs> The one that Alice Cooper was working in, the one that everybody's the, working the in. The one with right the knee, yeah. The desk. Right. So, so Billy came and we were going to write and he was all like, oh God, oh, I got this room to write in and all of this. And I was, this has happened to me more than once with co-writers where I'm trying to write something really complicated and deep and, you know, sensitive. And he was getting pissed off. He was just like, he was trying to follow it with me, but he just like, well, he just threw it all out. At one point he said, he said, why don't we do something like this? And just picked up the guitar and went, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, you know, and just completely changed and turned it into this, you know, kind of flirty, sexy, forget all this, you know, sadness, you know, come on, let's, and, and then we were on a roll and, uh, I was saying things like, you're stuck in my head like an 80s song, you know, <laughs> getting a bit of Joan Jett in there. Yeah. So that's how that one started. Stuck in my head like an 80s song. That's a, that's a good visual. This process has been, what, how many years now for the two albums? The record was pretty much done between November of 
2016 yep. and March of 2017. Oh, marvelous! So it was. It wasn't. It wasn't mixed okay. then. I don't think any more recording went on after that, except maybe on. Oh my God! I did a session where I came in and, as I said, played, you know, played some whirly and and vibes. But other than that, it just occurred in that period of time, and we did not work every week, you know. So it would be like I said four songs cut in three or four days. And then at the next week, we would cut another three songs on a Monday, Tuesday, and, oh, okay, Greg Reese is free. Let's do a day with him. Let's do a day with Benmont. And, you know, we'd send things out, like Patrick Warren did some overdubs with strings. And, Beautiful. you know, Ralphie did his horns remotely. But aside from that, you know, it, it wasn't labored. And, and Dave and I, I mean, he's just the best. I think, you know, aside from Dave's talent, obviously, which is huge, you know, he, he could give uh, instruction to people on how to communicate because it's the most important thing. He's the best communicator. I never, there's been times where I've been really intimidated, you know, especially before Blackbird, where I just felt like I can't ask Dave Way to change this in the mix. Like, I just can't. You know, he's missed it twice. I, you know, and I'd, I'd be just really nervous. He, he'll probably laugh hearing this. And really nervous about writing him an email and, and saying, you know, referencing a record. And I, and I thought, he's going to think I don't know anything. I'd say, can you make it sound a little more distorted? And I thought he would just like, oh, what is she talking about? She doesn't know what she's talking about. And then he'd send it back and it would be knocked out of the park. And he'd never express an opinion about like, oh, that's a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. He would just respond and then send an MP3 and, and, you know, say, this is sounding pretty good to me. And that would be it. He's always up for trying it and... And, and and that just makes it, it it makes it so great to work with him. Yeah, you know? CJ Vanston calls that the seven minute rule. And what it is is it usually takes on average seven minutes to try something, or you can spend four hours arguing about it. So How many good. times has some has, have you said to somebody, "Oh, I'd like to re-sing that part," and they're like, "Oh no, I love it," and blah, 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 blah. and then you get into this half an hour discussion, and it was a verse, and you could have sung it in far less than seven minutes and known whether it was going to be better or worse. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty funny. And those three magic words. Let's yep. try it. Uh, yeah. And uh, and as uh, from a production standpoint, I've learned more from artists because of that. Because I can't... A lot of the times you can visualize how something's going to work. Of course, if somebody says to you, you've got a piano ballad and somebody says to you, I want to put heavy metal guitars on it, you're going to be like, uh, you know what I mean? You you can visualize something as 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 black and white, something as extreme as that. However... You know, there's some ideas that you have to try to even, you know, really kind of understand the potential of it. And I've learned so much more. I mean, I always say this, so I, I'm, I apologize for anybody who's heard me. But if I'm writing with a teenage girl and they've got an idea for a lyric, who am I to, you know, to, to tell them? It's like, what do I know about being a teenage girl? <laughs> it's, Hopefully not very <laughs> yes, much. <exactly. laughs> I have a five-year-old girl, but not, you know, a daughter, but... Uh, we, yeah, you'll I'll soon, soon know. know a bit more about yeah, it, but uh, at presently at the moment, I know nothing. Yeah, exactly. We, we learn so much from our artists. And yes, you're right. Dave is one of those guys that makes you feel very at ease. And then you forget that he has worked with all these incredible people and delivered so much incredible work. But, it, you know, we all work with people we like more than anything else. There's lots of people that can play instruments and record, but you, you go and work with the guns you like. Yeah, which is, that, that brings a whole other conversation, you know, when people are up and coming and they want to know, like, how do you write that first cold email to go work with someone? And, you know, you have to say, well, it's a long shot because they're going to work with their friends. Yep. You know? There is one thing I want to say. Um, like, I remember there was a session at Tim White, Timothy White, you know, like me, he's not trained. He can't read, but he comes up with the greatest parts on guitar and sounds. And there was one demo I had. Um, it was on the other record, All These Hellos. It was for Life Lessons. 
And I never really finished the demo, and so I didn't know what to do at the end. So I took the middle eight and I just tagged it on the end again. It went back to the middle eight, and I kept saying, this is wrong. We shouldn't do this. This is just, I just tagged it on. And then, you know, he felt comfortable enough to say, you know what? I really like that it goes back there. I think it's cool that it does. Right. And it's great to create an environment where people are not looking at their watch waiting to get home where they're invested in what you're doing and feel that they can say that. And and then that you can say, oh, well, let's try it that way. And, and it was better. Yep. I mean, that's that's a beautiful thing. You, you're right about, uh, you know, sort of the up and coming stuff. And what we touched on earlier about session players, you know, saying, oh, I can play that. It's like, yes, but, you know, can you get to that place where you're playing something that's pure and supports the song, you know, quickly, if not immediately? I mean, the greatest attribute of working with anybody is that they feel like they're part of your team. You know, um, Dave was part of your team. The musicians were part of your team. You're you're the perf- you're the artist leading it, but you're not having to lead it with a whip, trying to get everybody to do the right things. You feel like they're they they are doing the right things. They support you. They get what you're saying. They can interpret your ideas without you having to sort of sit down and have a five hour discussion before you you know put down a bass part. You know. Well, there's a there's a few things I want to say about all this. One is. Please. You know, insecurity, particularly being a female musician in a room that could really be a boys club, you know? Um, I mean, uh, even, you know, when we knew each other in London or before that even, I've always been a band's leader. I've been to so many rehearsal places lugging my gear. I used to go down to the West End and buy tape and I learned how to use a razor blade and, you know, all this stuff. But I had no idea. I was so insecure. I thought I didn't know anything. I thought, oh, the people who know are the people working at Air Studios. And, and, you know, I, I just thought, I just kind of know, but I don't know. And so when you're in a room there's nothing more intimidating than picking up a guitar and being in a room with Dean Parks. You sure. Know? Even with the nicest of musicians, those people who are on this record and Dave and everything, there were so many times I wanted to hide. There were so many times I thought, don't play, just sing, you know? But I would make myself pick up the guitar, you know? I'd say, no, I, I would actually go against the grain. I'd have to push against it and say, no, I want to play on the tracking. No, I want to plug into that Fender amp. N- you know, and, and then there would be a bit of surprise, like, who played that lick? Louise played that lick, you know? I mean, you can't possibly know this, like you haven't been a teenage girl, you know? <laughs> you, <laughs> you As you've also haven't been a female musician. If it hadn't been for early, you wouldn't have realized that, yes. You worked with female musicians and, you know, there is this perception of it's like the girl singer playing a guitar, you know, the chick singer, oh, she plays guitar too, you know, but the perception is, well, you really need the cats to really pull off the guitar part and all of that. Well, you know, it took me so many decades to realize that that wasn't true. I know I'm breaking up on your... It, it, it's good to know that, that a lot of women musicians are going through that, you know, especially if you're a guy in the studio or a musician. It's, it's just, you know, that little bit of like, hey, turn up. What are you playing? You know, that that... That it could just make everything better just to lean in rather than lean away and go, oh, let me see, we'll get, you know, let's just get on with it and get the part with the cats who we know are going to nail it, you know? Yeah, but it's, it's, it is it is interesting, though, when I think of, you know, talking of guitar singers, um, you know, two, two of my favorite are Joan Armour Trading and Joni Mitchell. I'm just learning to play acoustic guitar, a guitar, and I hear this part, and I wonder, like, I wonder who the guitarist is. Buy the record, flip it over. It's Joan Armour Trading, and it's like the whole everything about that song is built from the performance of the acoustic guitar, and she would have written it playing acoustic guitar. So. God bless Glenn Johns for realizing this and not like hiring some famous guy to come in and replay it because everything is built from that. And then you think of like. You know, Joni, you think of like, and Hygiera is one of my favorite albums ever. You know, think of Coyote. Da, 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 da. That groove, 
everything is built around the feel of her guitar playing and, you know, Jarko and, and Don Elias and, and Larry Colton, all these incredible players, but they exist around her. So I, I, I know what you're saying, yeah. and, but that's great production, isn't it? Where a producer can, can understand this because there's plenty of times when regardless of, of, of gender, you re replace things because you want it to be better. That's, that's a different discussion, obviously. But in this instance, dismissing somebody just because of their gender is... I've seen it. I, I know when we did a, some stuff with Julie, who we're obviously both close mutual friends with, one of our producers that we worked with wouldn't, couldn't talk to her, couldn't have a proper conversation with her and used to speak through me and goes, can you tell Julie? And she'd be like, like sitting there looking around like, wait there, why can't he just say something to me? He just, he was really super old school and just didn't know he was just used to working with like the stones and everything being, you know, like sex, drugs and rock and roll. And he had a really hard time communicating with her. It's tough. I mean, mm. that from an artist's point of view, she's sitting there thinking, I wrote this song and you're speaking to the guy who's playing bass on my track about me. That's it's, like me making my 10th record and somebody saying that my mother must be proud of me. <laughs> you know? Are you, are you speaking from experience? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's people um, it sometimes don't want to go out outside of the filters of their own reference, you know, and right. it's a it, it's worth it. It's worth it to be vulnerable and say, I, you know, I don't really have this in my experience. I don't need to relate it to something that I have had before or a, another reference. Why don't I just, you know, talk to this person or why don't I deal with what's in front of me as what it is in front of me? afresh without putting it yeah. through the filters of you know what you think from before yeah it's it's a thing and i don't want to make a big thing about it no no only i'm just talking about my own own journey is that you know i mean a lot of what i'm doing now you know i mean i'm referred to as a seasoned musician and a <laughs> veteran and all of that but but i i actually really feel like most like i did when i was a teenager than i ever felt before creatively only you know way less intimidated and nervous and more willing to uh trust my ideas even the record which was made you know three years ago or started anyway, and then some of the songs were older. So, you know, everything feeds into the next project you're doing. So that's where I was then. You know, now at this point, I'm really enjoying the stripped down quality of playing the songs. And, and I, I, I'm looking forward to doing a lot of recordings of some of these songs and new songs, you know, with not a lot of overdubs. Right. You know? I think there's a simplicity in it. it it's interesting because, you know, when we, lo we listen to some... Albums we talked about like Abbey Road and, and the White Album, especially Abbey Road, that probably feels quite overdubbed, you know, it feels like it has lots of parts. But in modern, in a modern world, these albums are pretty much like vocal acoustics. You, you know what I mean? It's, uh, we, we live in a world now yeah, where we're so yeah. used to having 120 tracks going at all times. And yet the music we all grew up loving is essentially three or four people in a room playing and then a couple of overdubs. Um, maybe some stacked backgrounds and a guitar solo or something like that, but that's and a string and, and some orchestration. But ultimately, um, this is a very, very focused album. I think your album is really, it's all about the songs. I think your melodic sense is really, I, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. I feel like you, you just, you're in a place now where your melodies are just m immediately memorable. I don't know how conscious that is. Or, or or not, you know, I what I loved, um, the John Lennon quote that Jack Douglas told me, he asked him while they were working together, he said, he said, John, what's the most important thing you've learned about songwriting? And, and John Lennon said, tell the truth and make it rhyme. And I think that um, that sort of sim sim simplicity, uh, it doesn't mean it's dumb. It just means it's simple to understand. You know what I mean? Like when I hear a melody that that is hooky to me and memorable, yeah, you could call it simple, but it's not. It's it it just means that I don't have to like listen to it to fifty times to decide do I like that. You know, so I I I love where you're at. I feel like, and I'm glad that somebody um, also felt that way and was able to fund these records so you can make these beautiful albums. Yeah, it's it was life changing. 
I hope this carries on. Thank you. It is a good feeling to be able to, you know, get that out there. Is he happy? Oh, yeah. He's so happy. He's so happy. He, uh, he, he really feels like he's kind of living vicariously through the records. And, oh. and it, it really makes him happy that he was able to facilitate these things to happen. Louise, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Warren. Thanks. Thank you for doing this. Oh, it's a lot uh, of fun. It's always great to talk to you. Wonderful. Well, you know, we'll find more, more excuses, of course. Have a marvellous time, everybody. Thank you, Louise. Please check out the record. Of course, there's a Spotify and all other links down below. Check it out. Um, leave any comments and questions below. If there's anything pertinent to Louise, I'll ask her. Maybe you can answer any questions. I would love to do that. The record's called Two Different Movies. So get some popcorn and let's get some movie watching. Marvellous. <laughs> Okay, thanks ever so much. Have a marvellous time, everybody. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions. 